Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Curlin, and I'm an attorney advisor with Equitas. Um, I anticipate by the number of participants, we're going to have some folks joining us as we progress. But uh, given all the content we want to cover today, I want to get started. And of course, this webinar is going to be recorded, so it'll be available for folks who uh, can't join us till a little bit later. Uh, initially, as indicated, I'm from Equitas. I want to thank the network for inviting us to uh, give this webinar-based presentation, Overcoming the Consent Defense. Uh, before we get into the substance, let me just sort of address some housekeeping matters first. Uh, first thing is telling you a little bit about Equitas. Equitas's mission is to improve the quality of justice and sexual violence, intimate partner violence, stalking, and human trafficking cases by developing, evaluating, and refining prosecution practices that increase victim safety and offender accountability. As a national training and technical assistance provider, Equitas develops resources, conducts training such as this, and offers 24 seven consultations for prosecutors and allied professionals. For more information on Equitas, please visit our website at equitasresource.org. And uh, because the spelling of our website isn't always intuitive, we have it uh, set out right here, equitasresource.org. And I also wanna let you know, you can follow Equitas on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. The link to each is available on our website. I initially wanna note that the content today that we're presenting in uh, this morning's presentation and our strangulation presentation after the launch is complying with the uh, fair use laws. I'd also want to note that the webinar is supported by the U.S. Department of Justice of Violence Against Women. The information presented in this webinar does not necessarily reflect the views of OVW. And for additional fine print, you can uh, review the rest of the slide and the materials will be made available later. Uh, a little bit about me, and uh, there's a picture of my headshot. I'm currently an attorney advisor with Equitas. Prior to joining Equitas, I worked for 16 years as a prosecutor in the district attorney's office in Berks County, Pennsylvania, where I served as chief deputy district attorney, chief of trials, and an assistant district attorney. Throughout my career, I su successfully prosecuted a variety of offenses, including domestic violence homicides, campus sexual assaults, cold case sexual assaults, intimate partner violence, stalking, child image exploit, child pornography and image exploitation, child abuse and molestation, and human trafficking. Um, I'm hoping that some folks that are uh, attending and watching today's webinar might have actually gotten to meet in person uh, when myself and my colleague Jane Anderson had an opportunity to uh, present on domestic violence issues in South Dakota in early December of last year, prior to uh, pandemic concerns being raised. Uh, we were in Rapid City in Sioux Falls, and we were certainly uh, grateful to be in your state and get to drive across it and, and meet some of you folks face to face. So let me talk a little bit about what our objectives and what we're hoping to do, at least in this morning's presentation. This is really a two-part training we have. Uh, this morning, we're talking about overcoming or strategies to overcome the consent defense in sexual violence cases. And this afternoon, we're gonna be talking about understanding strangulation issues and strategies and tactics to investigate and prosecute those cases. There's overlapping issues in each of these types of uh, prosecutions. So hopefully the slides and information we're presenting isn't going to be too redundant. Uh, but one of our addressing first and looking first to the overcoming the consent defense, one of the first things we wanna do in, in in prosecuting these cases is understand how to recognize the dangerousness of known offenders and understand and figure out how to identify and collect evidence of their predatory behavior. Throughout consent-based defense, consent defense-based cases, we want to learn for ways we can support the victim and witness credibility with cooperating evidence, how we can find that cooperating evidence in the investigation and strategies to introduce it in court so the jury can make a fully informed decision with the full context of what happened. And when these cases go to trial, we wanna talk about ways we can recreate the reality of the crime rather than just taking off elements in a uh, statutory offense. So to begin our discussion, we're really gonna go back to basics and uh, 
talk about the overall mission and strategy in any kind of sexual violence prosecution or domestic violence prosecution is that we really wanna be victim-centered and offender-focused. And those, mo those missions should be what motivates our work, motivates our strategies throughout the case, from when the crime is first reported to us or brought to our desk, through to preparing it for trial, presenting it at trial to a jury, up through sentencing and any post-trial uh, and post-conviction appeals. Let's talk a little bit about what it means to be victim-centered uh, and, and give some definition to that term so it's not something just uh, uh, that, that's amorphous. Victim-centered, what that approach means in, in a basic level is that recognizing that victim survivors are gonna be central to the criminal justice system, that our victims and our survivors of sexual violence, they're not just talking exhibits or talking props, uh, but they're people who've been traumatized by the most invasive of crimes and that they are going to be the key for us building our case. When we're building our case, a victim-centered practice is going to recognize that as we develop strategies, as we develop tactics, as we proceed throughout, one of the things or that is going to be paramount is the victim's safety, their privacy, and their well-being. And of course, this is the empathetic thing to do and because it's gonna support victims and it's the decent thing to them. But a victim-centered approach is, is, is we're, we're diligent in that and respect their autonomy, their dignity and recognize the primacy of their safety. One of the things that sort of support of victims does is it's going to reduce victim attrition and it's going to be allow victims to participate in our system and in the case more fully and make them more supportive. So a victim-centered approach, it's not only the right thing to do for a victim, but even if you are just about catching the bad guy and catching the offender, being victim-centered is going to get more, is going to invite more participation from our victims. Now let's talk about the offender-focused uh, part of it. And what the offender-focused uh, approach means, and it's balanced with a victim-centered approach, is that when we have our cases and when these cases are brought to us, is that the offender-focused approach, it focuses on what the offender did, how the offender planned. An offender-focused approach is meant to be a contrast in a way to a victim-focused approach. And this could be the practice in some jurisdictions or maybe in less informed times, where when you get a case or you get a prosecution, you automatically start looking for what the victim did wrong or the problems the victim brings. Uh, what the offender-focused approach does is it sort of shifts that lens onto the offender. So rather than us worrying about the vulnerability of our victims, it shifts that focus onto an offender's strategy and practice in targeting victims who they believe they can successfully exploit it recognizes that offenders to perpetrate their crime, they're gonna be depending on the public and prosecutors and investigators accepting myths about sexual assault and the sexual violence that's going to help them avoid accountability. And in the offender-focused approach, what we're doing is we're keeping our focus on the actions, the behaviors, the characteristics, and the intent of the offender. It doesn't mean we blind ourselves to the challenges in victim behavior or victim responses, but we're analyzing those challenges in the context of how the offender picked this victim and how the victim was then, a, or how the offender was then able to complete their offense or complete their crime, how they plan their crime. Because of course, contrary to popular conception, the reality of sexual violence is that most offenders are going to be known to the victim. The use of deadly weapons and physical injury is not typical and is generally unnecessary for offenders to complete their crime and to perpetrate sexual violence is that victims are going to have unique responses to trauma. And most importantly, it's never the victim's, it's never going to be the victim's assault, the fault. The offender-focused approach is also going to be ready to identify and look for ways that offenders use non-traditional or maybe counterintuitive type weapons or devices in order to complete their crime of sexual violence or to victimize our victims. 
And these kinds of non-traditional weapons, a lot of which we're going to be delving into more deeply, it's not just going to be the stranger in an alley or with a, with a knife or a gun or something like that, but most, most rapists are going to be using tools like alcohol and drugs, like coercion of the victim, isolating the victim, getting them alone where they can be accessible, manipulating victims, especially when there's a pre-existing pre relationship between our offender and the victim, and there's that level of trust that can then be exploited by the offender, uh, utilizing deception, as well as utilizing tools like intimidation. Now, these kinds of non-traditional weapons, it's a lot more subtle and a lot more nuanced uh, then the sexual violence uh, predator or the rapist who is going to use explicit physical force or the gun or the knife or something like that. Uh, but this is going to be where most sexual offenders are going to be perpetrating their crimes. The ones with the explicit use of force and the really damaged, physically injured, visibly physically injured victim, when those cases come across our door, they're easier to prosecute and they're easier to convict usually, but most offenders are gonna understand that as well. And they're gonna to wanna to complete their crime in a way that avoids them being caught, just like other types of offenders. Most offenders, when they're looking to commit crime, they wanna do it in a way that avoids them being held accountable. And as sexual offenders and rapists gain experience and refine their pattern, they're going to develop more sophisticated and nuanced ways to make victims vulnerable and which is going to require a, re a reaction from us to be able to get those victims and to be able to get those offenders and hold them accountable. So when we're investigating our case and when we're looking at our case and how to frame it and understand, we want to take our offender and we want to be looking for ways and trying to analyze the evidence in our case to be open to the idea and open to the evidence as to how our offender planned the case, how they strategized or how they, used, how they planned to get the victim alone, how they manipulated events or manipulated our victims, and how they engaged in predatory behavior. Sexual violence and rape, it's not a spontaneous a crime. It's not something where the incident or the opportunity presents himself and an offender decides, well, I'm going to perpetrate rape. But it's something they're planning, it's something that's plotted out, and something that they're laying a plan in which to perpetrate and also an escape route so that they aren't held accountable, either from victim selection, from location, or for, for any of these factors. And when we're looking at our case and looking at our evidence, we wanna be able to expose how the offender completed this, because it's usually never going to be explicitly stated by our offender. And this is going to be critical in overcoming consent cases, uh, because while these cases are the most difficult, they're going to be the safest for offenders to perpetrate and where most of our offenders are going to be living and where we want to get them held accountable. Now, in our offender behavior and analyzing, especially with consent based, uh, consent defense based cases, we want to be looking at how our offenders garner trust how they shift the blame to others, how they deny either some of the allegations or all of it, how they try to play the victim's own doubts and self-blames against them, maybe how they hide, the offender might hide behind the reputation they have in the community or the relationship with the victim, and how they make confrontation and suspicion uncomfortable. Because again, our, the sort of myth we have about sexual violence is that we can automatically know a sexual offender, that they might have an explicit look about them, or that they're untrustworthy, as opposed to the idea that a lot of offenders, they're gonna be using camouflage. Offenders might be using kindness or the nice guy sort of a demeanor as a cover or as a mask in which they can deploy their crime. And we wanna be able to look at our cases to, to apprehend when that's happening and then develop that with the jury so the jury can understand the premeditation and planning that goes into this crime, that goes into these crimes. This is really a critical point too in understanding offender, uh, uh, offender behavior is trying to recognize in the case the vulnerability of our victims which was identified, the same things that uh, the behaviors from the victim or the background of our victim that might make it seem like a challenging case to us is something that our offender also identified and utilized in, in 
deciding to, to pick this victim as opposed to others. The accessibility of the victim, was the victim in a bar and intoxicated and maybe more vulnerable for, for, from that? Was the victim accessible because the offend, offender developed a relationship of trust or an atmosphere of trust? Was the victim then maneuvered to some place where the offender could be alone with her? So it could just be in the offender's mind, a he said, she said. And of course, credibility issues. Is our offender picking someone that they know might not be accepted by society or believed by society and therefore more vulnerable, more likely to be victimized? Is the offender just placing it my word against their word? Is the offender sort of asking us or inviting us to make it a he said, she said type situation without analyzing the offender's motivation to cover up a crime versus a lack of motivation for many victims to disclose sexual assault as it exposes them to all sorts of vulnerabilities and it, it makes a victim feel vulnerable for having to talk about maybe a mistake they felt they made and the things that the victim's blaming themselves for having to share with the rest of the world. And looking at our consent cases too, and deciding the, the resources we wanna put into investigating the case and also being able to charge these cases, even when they're tougher, we also wanna consider the dangerousness. And there's several aspects in which we wanna consider the dangerousness involved uh, from these offenders with a suspect known to the victim, because a lot of times these consent cases, there's gonna be a pre-existing relationship, maybe even an intimate relationship between our victim and offender. Um, so if the victim reports, uh, there might be danger to our victim because the offender is gonna know the victim and it might be explicit threats. It might be intimidation through family relationships, through their own social networks, might be trying to, to essentially slut shame them or something like that. We also want to consider the dangerousness of these offenders to unknown victims because, of course, it's not like rape is a sort of crime where once it's perpetrated, it's out of the offender's system. But when it is committed, the offender is going to think about and refine ways and methods that can be perpetrated on, on other victims. And for most offenders, there's not going to be a sort of moral bright line, well, I'll commit sexual violence against someone I know, but not against someone unknown. And this is revealed by a lot of testing of untested sexual assault kits. And I know some studies have shown that the uh, serial offenders that they perpetrate against known and victims that are known and unknown to them. And of course, sexual violence offenders too, when we have a disclosure from a victim and an opportunity to investigate and potentially prosecute and hold someone accountable, we also want to consider the dangerousness to society in the terms of serial offenders, of other sexual offenses this offender might perpetrate, as well as, of course, other kinds of crimes that this offender could perpetrate as well, crossover offenders. So having a sort of general uh, structure of, of what a, a victim-centered and offender-focused approach looks like, Let's look on a consent defense and uh, sort of look at some basic building blocks that are going to be make up a consent defense. One is going to be a credibility idea. And this is the, the misconception of a he said, she said type, of, type uh, approach to it. And again, the difficulty or challenge, uh, I should say, with a he said, she said type approach is these cases are never really he said, she said, because if the offender says, I did it, but it was consensual, and the victim said it wasn't consensual, the offender, more often than not, is gonna have a lot more motivation to be deceptive in that than the victim. And so it's never really just a he said, she said, or that those scales just balance. Usually the victim has a lot more to lose and risk by coming forward and disclosing uh, than offenders are going to do. Because of course, when a victim comes forward, and most victims know this because of, this is what happens and this is what can contribute to such delayed disclosures and delayed reports, there's going to be a lot of character attacks on the victim. Why did you wait to report? Why did you let yourself drink too much? Why did you go home alone with them or let yourself be alone with this offender? Um, why didn't you cut off the relationship immediately? Uh, why did you text him afterwards? Everything the victim did is going to be put under a microscope. And when we're building these cases, what we want to do is we don't want to be ignorant of that or ignore that. 
But we also want to take that same microscope, that same magnifying glass, and put it on the defender's conduct and the, defend, and the offender's behavior as well. The other factor too is gonna to be jury nullification or compromise verdicts. Because these cases are so challenging and because offenders don't fit the stereotype of what we think offenders look like, but they can look like someone next door, these cases can be challenging for jurors to think that someone who looks like a member of their family can perpetrate a crime. And so we wanna be sure that we're careful on voir dire and that we're careful with our evidence to educate the, the jury about the, the type of planning and premeditation that went in this crime. And of course, the other component of a consent defense, because more often than not, there's gonna be some sort of factor of alcohol involved in consent-based, consent defense-based cases. Uh, there might be an element of blackout versus pass out, which we're gonna discuss in detail a little bit later on. In thinking about consent though, we wanna talk a little bit about what consent is not. And this is a great piece from, from Rain, uh, which uh, you see the link to and uh, can be looked at individually. Uh, but what we wanna recognize is that consent is not going to be, consent is not refusing to acknowledge no from our victim, assuming that consent can be presumed by the way the victim is acting or certain clothes or flirting or someone under the legal age of consent. Uh, consent furthermore is also not happening when someone is incapacitated, not necessarily passed out, but someone is incapacitated due to drugs or alcohol, whether it was voluntary consumption or involuntary consumption. Uh, consent doesn't happen when someone's pressured into sexual activity using fear or intimidation or assuming permission to engage in a sexual act because you've done it prior, or because there's been a prior sexual relationship between the victim and the offender. I might also summarize a lot of these ideas and what can sometimes muddle the thinking. A victim's assent or, uh, or, or, or to sexual activity in the face of intimidation and the face of incapacitation due to drugs or alcohol is also not consent. Assent and consent should be distinguished from one another as well. So the issues and challenges we have in our consent case, we want to try to reframe with an offender focus. A lot of consent cases, there's going to be delayed disclosure. Uh, we want, when we have that delayed disclosure, rather than look at it as an insurmountable barrier to prosecution and to investigation, we wanna look at that delayed disclosure and think about who caused it. In other words, if our victim was someone who wouldn't be believed, if our victim was someone who maybe was vulnerable from drinking or from, uh, from making choices or decisions that could later be challenged, then why did the defendant choose this victim? Was there intimidation perpetrated or shaming involved by the offender with the victim that contributed to the delayed disclosure? After it happened, don't tell anyone about this or you'll get in trouble or I'm gonna tell the, the, the rest of the people in our, in our network, in our community that you're a slut or that you came on to me. In other words, with this delayed disclosure, we wanna just not be looking at that delayed disclosure in isolation, but we wanna be looking at in the context of anything the, the offender did to contribute that to that de de delayed disclosure from selection of this victim uh, to explicit or implicit threats. If there's a prior relationship or pre-existing relationship and, and, and a level of trust built up between our victim and the offender, then one of the things we wanna do is that consent defense or what the defense is framing as a consent defense, we wanna point out that the victim didn't know that she was gonna be sexually assaulted, that she was gonna be raped. The offender did know, and the offender took that level of trust and exploited it. Um, maybe a good theme to capture this with is maybe he knew her, but she didn't know him. Because again, the underlying premise of any sort of sexual violence cases is on some level, our offender was planning this attack. It's our job as prosecutors and working with our investigators to understand and to uncover, no matter how subtly it was covered up, 
how our offender planned this attack from victim selection to anything else. And of course, voluntary intoxication. These can be one of the most challenging consent defense cases. But again, and we have separate presentations on voluntary intoxication. We're only gonna address it a bit here. We wanna recognize that alcohol as a tool for an offender to perpetrate their offense makes things incredibly easy for our offender. You don't need force when you have a victim who's vulnerable because of intoxication, whether it's voluntary or involuntary. Now, when we're working with our law enforcement partners, let's talk a little bit about the sort of things that we can use to build our investigation and build these cases up. And one of the aspects we want to talk about is that ideally, how these, uh, how these cases are going to be investigated, it's going to be more than just interviewing the victim and making a charging decision or investigative decision based on just that alone but rather it's gonna be built up as holistically and as multi-pronged as possible. I, one of the comparisons I always like to think of is that a good sexual violence case, a good rape case, sexual assault prosecution, the investigation for that and the foundation for that is gonna be built up as holistically and as thoroughly as a murder investigation or as a homicide investigation. And when we consider the, the risk that a lot of these offenders uh, uh, present in danger to the victim, danger to other victims in terms of serial offending and cross offending, uh, that might be a valid sort of uh, uh, deployment of resources. But what we wanna do, and of course what our case is gonna be built around, is interviewing the victim in a trauma-informed way. And we're gonna talk about trauma-informed practices a little bit later on. But after we interview the victim, we're looking to corroborate the disclosure as much as possible. We get in a statement from the offender whenever possible, and we seek it through legal means as aggressively as possible. We find as many secondary witnesses, we look for other victims on the assumption that maybe our offender, this wasn't the first time they perpetrated, and it rarely is. And sometimes those other victims are gonna be difficult to find because most victims don't disclose. But when we can find them, we use them to help build up our case and our prosecution too. Look for ways to corroborate. If our victim says they went out or they were at a restaurant or a bar, we look for secondary witnesses that can corroborate that. Maybe an Uber or cab driver, family, friends, witnesses, expert testimony, and lots of kinds of expert testimony, whether it's gonna be a victim behavior expert testimony that can be there to help educate our juror about victim responses to sexual violence, Maybe it's gonna be a toxicologist, maybe it's gonna be a forensic expert, so they can help the jury understand issues that maybe they don't know that they don't know. Uh, of course, using digital evidence, and whenever possible, if there's any sort of electronic evidence utilized, if the victim utilized their phone, if the offender utilized the phone, uh, we wanna be obtaining that and analyzing that. And that might be, especially with the offender's devices, a good vehicle or a good way to find other victims as well. Medical evidence, especially if it was reported in time for sexual assault forensic medical exam, uh, is a good way too to build our cases. Even if there's not physical injury or trauma to our victim, the medical experts can help our jurors and fact finders understand why injury is not the holy grail or the sin qua non of, of a sexual violence case. And of course, forensic evidence. Ideally, after it's reported, what we're going to be working with our investigators to make sure happens is that the physical scenes or physical spaces involved or that we know about from our victim interview or from, second in, from, from secondary witnesses, that it's processed for evidence. If that processing for evidence in a forensically sound way isn't possible, then hopefully at a minimum what we're doing is we're trying to get photographs of the locations where the assault occurred or the locations associated with the crime. If nothing else, this kind of, these kinds of photographs or diagrams and maps might make it easier for the victim and other witnesses to help the jury to explain what happened and understand what happened. If, it's, if the, the assault happened in someone's residence and no one involved in the case lives there anymore and no one will give consent to take photos, even a photograph of the exterior of the location might be a good vehicle or good instrument to help the victim at, at trial later on to describe what happened. 
Now, of course, the center of any sort of investigation is going to be the victim disclosure. And we're going to talk a, a bit about trauma-informed interview. And I note that we have separate presentations that focus entirely on trauma-informed interview practices. So this is rather going to be the, the sort of Cliff's notes of it. Uh, but some general principles for a trauma-informed interview is that when it happens, and especially as prosecutors, assuming that we mostly have a prosecutor audience today, is that we want to make sure that we're not a necessary witness to the case, and so that we want to have a witness. Of course, we don't coach our victim. We also want to let our victim know that we're not going to be judging or disparaging their choices or what happened, and that our first goal is to ascertain the truth. Our second goal is to build our case. I think a lot of principles, the exact form of a trauma-informed interview, it might look different in different circumstances. I think the basic building blocks for any kind of trauma-informed interview is that we are trying to make the, the victim feel safe and the victim feel comfortable. Again, not only because that's a practice that's gonna be the empathetic thing to do or the nice thing to do in a victim-centered practice, but by making the victim safe and making the victim feel comfortable, we're putting the victim in an environment where it's gonna be easier to facilitate a disclosure uh, with that. So all these premises here, we wanna be thinking of it, how are we making the victim feel safe and the victim feeling comfortable? Yes, we need to have a witness there, uh, but when we have a witness, we either in trial prep or when we're first meeting our victim, trying to evaluate the case for a charging decision, uh, we want to help the victim understand in, uh, that our witness is there not because we don't trust the victim, uh, but our witness is there so that we can have someone help us remember or understand. Um, that let the victim know at the beginning that we're not here to judge them. They don't have to worry about feeling uncomfortable with us but we're trying to build as strong a case as we can to help them. Um, that we wanna learn the truth, and the more of the truth we know, the easier it's gonna to be to help them. Most importantly, part of a trauma-informed practice is gonna be learning to listen. A lot of times, and I know as a lawyer, I love to talk, and sometimes it's a lot more challenging for me to listen, but a big component, and and a really significant component of trauma-informed practices is going to be to just listen quiet, sit quietly and listen to the victim and understand that because of the effects and impact of trauma, it might be challenging for victims to disclose what happened in a chronologically linear way, that the, the disclosure might come out in bits and pieces or in patches but the more we just listen and receive, maybe the, the more a lot of victims are gonna be capable of being able to put together or recall more details that they otherwise wouldn't with our interruptions. Maybe some good prompts to start this conversation and start these conversations with victims is asking for victims' descriptions of themselves, the defendant, the relationship, and not just zeroing in on the assault, but getting the context for what happened before, during, and after the assault, building up the whole context of where this occurred in our victim's background. Going into the interviews and working with victims of, of sexual violence, we wanna be aware of the effects of trauma on memory. And there's a lot of studies and analysis uh, about how precisely trauma can impact me memory. Um, at a minimum, it's fair to say that trauma can impair memory. So recognizing that, one of the things we wanna do is not just ask what happened, um, and certainly recognize that asking what happened when in a chronological fashion is not gonna be the, the best method for victims to recall events, but maybe we wanna ask for sensory details. Is there anything you remember hearing or smelling? Or what, did, what were you feeling at a moment? And sort of keying in on those questions might sort of cause a victim to ring in on other details that they otherwise wouldn't be remembered. Victim may be fearful and we wanna be respectful of that and as best as we can try to avoid or minimize repeated trauma. We also wanna recognize, of course, that victims are gonna frequently disclose in layers and we shouldn't ever anticipate or expect uh, that we're gonna have a one and done meeting with the victim and that's it. Our first meeting might just be for the purposes of building rapport of building that relationship so the victim can get to know us a little bit, 
we can get to know the victim on a human level and also understand how they communicate and then build from there. Overall, we want to always recognize that disclosure is difficult. Most victims never report to law enforcement so that when we actually have a victim who's disclosing us to us, this is gonna be a rare opportunity to get an offender who's probably perpetrated against victims who never disclosed. And so we wanna take this disclosure and just treat the, the precious item of evidence it is and be respectful of it and nurture it and listen to it and not force it. And part of that is recognizing, of course, is that disclosure is a process, uh, not an event. Now, part of the disclosure and our victim in their disclosure might not be able to provide all the details or all the answers uh, but in so much as they can we want to be looking for those details from our victim's disclosure that can give us evidence of cooperation or leads for in investigation that can lead to co cooperation this includes secondary witnesses um, if there's medical evidence involved, a sexual nurse examiner or sexual assault forensic examiner, if they took an examination in the history of the complaint, that might also provide information. Just because no one saw the assault and because most assaults aren't uh, uh, committed in front of witnesses doesn't mean there aren't any witnesses because there are often going to be witnesses that were leading up to the assault or subsequent to the assault. And that can start building this holistic picture of the events that happened before and after the assault. But just because we have these witnesses identified doesn't mean we want to end it there. We want to make sure these witnesses are interviewed and we want to follow the leads. I would suggest too that when we contact these witnesses, and this is from the mistakes I've learned in my career when I was prosecuting, when we find these secondary witnesses, we want to make sure that we have contact information for them that's more than just a phone number that might not be available a year, a year and a half later when the case is getting ready to go to trial. Uh, if there's social media contact information that we can use for witnesses, we want to make sure we have that recorded. If there's friends or family that can be able to find our secondary witnesses when they're needed, we want to make sure we know how to reach them. Ideally, too, we also want to have these statements from our secondary witnesses memorialized in some way, either by video recording or what have you, especially if that's a regular practice in our jurisdiction. But that can make things easier at trial in terms of especially trial that might happen long after the fact in admitting things like prior recorded recollection or using things like prior consistent or inconsistent statements. When we're talking to our victim and talking to our witnesses too, we also want to be listening to them from the perspective of being able to look for evidence of the offender's actions, uh, because this is going to start building our offender-focused prosecution, such as look for evidence as to how the offender may have been in control as to the location uh, of the victim and the offender, movement between different locations, activity, and who made the decisions about what was happening uh, leading up to the sexual assault and after the sexual assault. Uh, if our victim was isolated from friends, who made that happen or how did that happen? If the victim was brought somewhere from somewhere else, who made that happen, how did that happen? Or if there are specific kinds of drinks or more drinks, then did the offender play a role? This is information that our victim by themselves, especially if it's an alcohol facilitated sexual assault, might not be able to provide. Our secondary witnesses may be able to, to fill in these gaps when we identify them and find them. And I should also note too that our victim might only know some secondary witnesses, but the following up with those people might lead of course to other secondary witnesses that can put together more of the events of the sexual assault. So I'm not going to go over each of these points here, but we also want to be looking for other evidence of the offender's actions. And these are all sorts of pieces of evidence that in the context of a case can show an offender who was in control and driving the events involved. Um, especially a lot of these are going to be inter really helpful in alcohol facilitated sexual assault cases especially if an offender is using the excuse that I was drunk too or a victim wasn't drunk enough. 
Uh, so of course, if our victim was too intoxicated to drive, but our offender wasn't, if our victim couldn't enter, uh, use a key or code to enter a uh, location or pay at an ATM or store, of course, using phones, even if we don't have the phone, even if, if our offender was able to use a phone, pulling up directions, it shows that they were in control of their actions and they could understand what's going on, which can also play into arguments as to whether the offender should have known that the victim wasn't consenting to sexual activity um, and what was happening. And of course, who undressed who is also gonna be evidence as well that we wanna develop and see that we can find out for who had control. Of course, the other thing that can make our, our case even stronger is bringing in evidence of, a, of an offender's other bad acts or other wrongs. And usually this evidence, it's not just going to present itself on a silver platter to us, but this is going to be something that we're going to have to really dig in. And he, what we're offering here are several sources where we can un, unpack and maybe develop potential other bad act evidence recognizing, of course, that a lot of victims that they're not going to be disclosing, even prior victims for this offender. But let's look at the offender's reputation. When we're talking to secondary witnesses or the people who know the offender, asking, has he ever been accused of this before? Uh, maybe who are some other people that the defendant's been involved with? Talking to those people. If our offender has a reputation for, for, for maybe being a Don Juan or a player or something like that, not all of those prior relationships were necessarily non-consensual, but some of them might have been. Follow social media accounts uh, about what was said about the offender. Digging into the offender's education and employment records. And I mean, not really just, and we're going to touch on this a little bit later, um, but really digging into the specifics of it. Also, too, looking for other, when we explore defendants on uh, uh, the criminal history, looking for any crimes or investigations that the defendant may not have been charged with, or if they may have developed into CODIS hits. Now, in the CODIS hits thing, I want to make, raise one point about always testing sexual assault kits. Um, in the past, and currently in some jurisdictions, there sometimes is reluctance uh, to test sexual assault kits when it's a known uh, consent defense-based case. The idea being, well, gee, the only purpose in, <coughs> excuse me, in testing the sexual assault kit is to prove contact. Who needs to do that if there's a consent defense? I would suggest that this isn't really a great practice to follow uh, because by testing the sexual assault kit, the results might help corroborate the victim's disclosure um, the offender might have minimized the level of physical contact or penetration, and that might, and the results on the assault kit might help impeach that, especially if uh, vaginal swabs that, that were used with a speculum. Uh, the other factor is, too, even if during the investigation is a, the defense asserts a consent-based defense, there's nothing that obligates the defendant to pursue that at trial. Uh, the defendant at trial could say, well, the, the police officer, when they interviewed me, I felt so intimidated. I said it was consent-based defense, but there actually was never any contact at all. At that point, if the sexual assault kit hasn't been tested, it's going to be too late to do so. But the other reason is, too, especially in the context of trying to find prior bad acts, is that by testing a sexual assault kit, even when there is a consent defense-based uh, based issue raised, is that by testing that kit, you're, you're get, and the defendant's known DNA profile is going to be found on these swabs, it can then be uploaded into CODIS. And it might potash, potentially match an unknown DNA profile in the CODIS database. Because we, we shouldn't uh, be married to this idea that a rapist that only perpetrates against known victims would never perpetrate against unknown victims. Uh, there can be this kind of serial or crossover offending and a tested rape kit can help one victim who never knew who, who her or his offender was find out that person's identity. When we're examining prior bad acts too, we want to recognize that in the criminal history or looking at prior, uh, prior employment records, that a lot of allegations of prior sexual violence that might have been brushed over or maybe not explicit. So we really want to look into the background <coughs> 
maybe sometimes a sexual assault case that was too hard to prosecute or maybe not as investigated with best practices we know today could have been reduced to some kind of loitering or burglary or a simple assault. As much as possible, we really want to dig into the uh, factual specifics of that case because it can reveal a prior bad act of sexual violence that might help prove our theory or prove our case in our current prosecution. Now, of course, the admissibility standard, uh, what's governing us for prior bad acts, is of course, when we do find evidence of other bad acts, uh, South Dakota is consistent with other jurisdictions with 404B1, is that the general rule is that the uh, evidence of another crime, wrong, or act, we can't offer it just to prove that the defendant's character uh, was acting in accordance. We can't introduce it just to show our offender is a bad egg. Uh, but we can use this evidence for a proper purpose. And the window of what is a proper purpose is pretty wide. Opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, identity, absence of mistake or lack of ac accident. Um, now we have to give notice, of course, but what we want to recognize in South Dakota case law is actually pretty, uh, not pretty generous. It's, it's, it recognizes the primacy of it and that it explicitly recognizes that 404B is a rule of inclusion, not exclusion. So if we have a proper purpose for why we're trying to introduce this bad act, it's appropriate then to bring it in, to show the absence of mistake about the defendant's uh, knowledge of lack of consent, the intent in perpetrating, to show how the defendant refined his pattern. And so the other bad acts, are, they're not admissible to show propensity for violence, but they may be admissible for other purposes. And of course, this is a citation to uh, South Dakota law. Now, another tool to show context is, is of course, going to be a stalking charge, which is, is in the, this is a good way to bring in these other acts other than a prior bad act, especially when there's a pattern of conduct uh, between an offender and victim who've known each other, have a pre-existing relationship, probably a, a, a intimate relationship of some kind. Stalking, I, I always say, it's probably one of the most underutilized tools uh, under charged and under prosecuted offenses because essentially I, what I uh, compare stalking to is folks who do drug trafficking cases, uh, they always bring corrupt organizations or RICO type charges not necessarily because the conviction on that charge is the primary purpose of the prosecution, but because it can open the door to so much background or other behavior or conduct by the offender. In the terms of sexual violence and domestic violence prosecutions, stalking can play that same role because by charging stalking, uh, which is based on a pattern of conduct, we, it's a bigger window to bring in a defendant's contact, conduct towards a particular victim and give that whole story to the jury and to our fact finder. And the reason why is because harass uh, is going to be a broad term, and this is the statutory definition of it. For the purposes of this chapter, harass means a knowing and willful course of conduct directed at a specific person which seriously alarms, annoys, or harasses the person and which serves no legitimate purpose. Now, certainly an instance of sexual violence can fit within that broad term, but in the context of a course of conduct, in other words, one or more two acts, there's lots of conduct that's perpetrated by an offender, which a fact finder could also be intended to seriously alarm, annoy, or harass. And by bringing in all those actions, it helps a fact finder or a juror get a, a more complete picture of a defendant's relationship and conduct towards a specific victim. Now, part of our investigation as much as possible should at least in, include an attempt to have an offender interview. And with consent uh, based defenses, more often than not, and I, I won't say this categorically, most offenders will be willing to agree to be interviewed by law enforcement and, and consent to being interviewed. Um, when this opportunity presents himself, uh, I don't think it should be viewed as, oh, well, we're going to get a confession and the offender will lay out all their plan. 
but we should use it as an opportunity to see if the offender can corroborate specifics of the victim's account, where they were and when they were. Use the encounter or the interview with the offender to understand more logistics about the encounter, especially if there's details that the victim couldn't recall or was unable to recall. Uh, find out how the offender got the victim alone, who undressed whom, what if any conversation took place. Um, it's also interesting too, especially in alcohol facilitated sexual assaults, oftentimes when you listen to the offender's account, there's almost this magical moment where there's a switch. Uh, where one moment our uh, victim is drunk and intoxicated and falling over themselves, except in the offender's telling when our victim comes, uh, comes time to sexual activity, then in the offender's version, they give a perfect consent to the sexual activity. That kind of uh, contrast is, is a good basis to, to present to a fact finder, something that just doesn't make sense when we're making appeals to, to who is believable and who is credible and who is not credible. But we can ask the offender too and just build up our record. Um, why does the offender think the encounter was consensual? Uh, ask the offender, find out how they're gonna attack the victim, get a preview of it. Why do they think the victim would make this up? And use this interview with the offender to start trying to find some of these 404B witnesses or incidents ever been accused of this before. And, uh, and, and even if the offender downplays it, we have a good follow-up uh, for investigation that we could do. Now, just because we have a, an offender statement that's a consent-based defense, it doesn't marry us to actually introducing this statement during trial. If an offender gives a self-serving statement, maybe we do need to introduce that at trial to introduce certain details, to introduce the specifics of physical contact that maybe uh, the victim can't call with specificity. On the other hand, though, too, just because our offender gives an interview uh, and gives a statement that's self-serving, consider saving that for cross-examination if we don't need it to prove our case and then using the contents in the statement to cross the defendant on. So we want to talk a little bit about alcohol facilitated sexual assault. And this topic is a challenge to, uh, to, to talk about in a succinct way. If you go to Equitas's website, you're going to see we have a two-part presentation uh, that's, uh, that's a total of three hours on alcohol facilitated sexual assault. The toxicology portion is 90 minutes. And I'm not going to cover all the specifics of that. I'm really going to try to cover a, a sort of a, a brief primer on toxicology here in about 15 minutes or so. And I also want to do it with the understanding that, uh, that hey, look, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a toxicologist. So what I uh, view and talk about here should be, should be considered in that context. But in considering uh, alcohol-facilitated sexual assaults, we want to recognize the double standard that's often at play here. A victim drinking, it, it makes them more blameworthy. An offender drinking is going to make them less to blame. Like, oh, it's just drunk, his judgment was gone, whereas victims, usually female, are going to be more to blame. Why would you make yourself so vulnerable by drinking like that? And, and, and you almost deserved what happened to you. And this is backed up by a lot of studies about how people viewed these alcohol facilitated sexual assaults and some challenges that we're gonna to have to a lot of times educate our jurors about and uh, in, in trial. This kind of conception or thinking, it's also contrary to a lot of the physiological realities and chemical realities involved with intoxication for ethyl alcohol. So when we're developing our case, and this is an abbreviated description of toxicology, we wanna to apply a knowledge of toxicology to prove alcohol facilitated sexual assault and also drug facilitated sexual assault. Now, one of the ways we can do that is by calling a toxicologist. A toxicologist can talk about the effects that substances have on the body. Now, a toxic, even if we don't have a BAC or a blood result, or even if we have a, uh, an allegation of a drug facilitated sexual assault, but we don't have uh, testing or forensic results, there are still reasons why a toxicologist could be appropriate because 
a properly qualified toxicologist, if they're given a description of symptoms and symptomology and reactions and responses, can educate the jury about what kind of substances could have that impact on a victim's body or educate our jurors generally about what toxicology can do. Um, we don't want to call toxicologists in every case where there's an alcohol facilitated sexual assault. Best case scenario is if our defense calls a toxicologist and we can get cross-examine them with some basic premises of toxicology. So let me talk a little bit about those basic premises of toxicology at this point. And that is one, that alcohol, how it impacts a, a person's body and how it can facilitate a, a sexual assault or rape is that it's a central nervous system depressant. In other words, it acts the same way that uh, when we're put under for surgery, the same sort of substances and drugs that an anesthesiologist uses. Alcohol, generally speaking, can have a disproportionate effect on women. And what I mean by this is that for a given average woman and a given average man, a male, drinking the same quantity of alcohol in the same amount of time, uh, the woman is going to have a higher BAC than the man. And th there, there's a lot of depth we could get into on this, but a lot of these reasons for this is not just because of the different size, but because of the impact of, of how alcohol is absorbed in the body. So a lot of the, uh, the defenses where the man says, oh, I was drinking too, I was drunk too, is usually... Uh, with the reality of, of toxicology, they're not going to be as intoxicated or as vulnerable as a female. Toxicologists can also establish, which is especially critical when there's blackout defenses, is that there can be visible manifestations of intoxication at different levels of, of intoxication. Other critical thing that a toxicologist can establish is that alcohol is not a hallucinogen. It's a central nervous system depressant. Now, the reason why this is important is because so often when we have people who, who were drinking and who were, who were impaired by alcohol, uh, there can be reasons to doubt what they remember. But the reality is, is that alcohol, it's not going to cause you to hallucinate things that you do remember, but it will impair you from remembering. So if we have a victim who was intoxicated who remembers saying no, nothing about alcohol would cause that factor to be imagined. That's something that probably actually happened, even if there's not a lot of other details uh, or, or things that our victim can remember about the event, that's usually not gonna be something imagined because alcohol isn't an hallucinogen. And a good way to sort of illustrate this in jury selection if possible or with a toxicologist is, most people have experienced drinking alcohol in their lives. And uh, most people after drinking alcohol to excess have memory of doing something embarrassing the next day. Uh, some maybe singing karaoke or maybe even something more salacious than singing karaoke. That memory of doing something embarrassing while drinking to excess is usually if never false. And the reason why that embarrassing memory isn't false is because alcohol, while alcohol lowers your inhibitions, it doesn't create false memories <coughs> because it's not a hallucinogen. The other thing that toxicologists can establish is that for the impact or alcohol to be removed, uh, the only thing that can do that is the passage of time. Because sometimes you might have jurors that have the belief that, oh, look, if if someone was being raped or sexually assaulted, that shocking event would sober, uh, sober one up immediately. But that's not the reality, of course, with the impact of toxicology. A startling event or coffee or a cold shower doesn't sober you up. Um, it just, uh, it, it, it doesn't, nothing but time can remove the impact of alcohol. Um, retrograde extrapolation, if we're trying to figure out what a victim's BAC would have been at a given point, um, this can only work if a toxicologist has a, a known number and, and, and also of drinks and how much the victim was drinking and also a history as to how much they've drank in the past and other factors that can affect absorption.
Um, and also toxicologists can establish that alcohol causes myopia, lack of judgment, and how intoxication makes you more vulnerable. Now, tips for prosecutors and law enforcement also when there's a drug facilitated sexual assault is that we should know when drugs are indicated and we should recognize that for drug facilitated sexual assaults, just because there's no confirmed drug from a testing doesn't mean that we can't prove there is a drug facilitated sexual assault. The reason why is because we want to remember that for, for testing for, drug, for drugs that are used for drug facilitated sexual assaults is that not every drug screen or medical screen tests for every kind of drug that can be used uh, to perpetrate or commit a sexual assault. I think uh, there was an article recently that there's 100 diff 150 different drugs and it's not like the every toxicology test tests for all 150 of those drugs. The other complicating factor is there is no standard threshold for what is a positive versus a not positive rate, uh, rate of a, a drug used for a drug facilitated sexual assault. So really what we're gonna be looking for for our drug facilitated sexual assault is our victim describing the impact on his or her body, how it made them feel, how they felt afterwards, and talking about the symptomology and asking our toxicologist, gee, is this consistent with any kind of controlled substance, as well as trying to unpack our, our 404B evidence and things of that nature. Now, one of the things we wanna do is when there's an alcohol facilitated sexual assault is we wanna prove our victim's level of intoxication at trial to show that they were too intoxicated to consent and that this was something apparent to the offender. One of the methods or devices we can do this is take a lesson from when we did DWIs, driving while intoxicated. Things we're looking, of course, for, and uh, folks re remember those cases, or maybe still are doing those cases, odor of alcoholic beverage, the bloodshot, watery eyes. This is why it's great also to have digital evidence or be exploring our cases for digital evidence because we might always have great evidence of our victim's intoxication through, through photographs that we're taking with the phone, through videos, movies, maybe social media posts, um, things like slurred speech, unsure balance, uh, while they aren't, uh, victims aren't given field tests, but we wanna be looking for those things in, in our victim that shows problems with balance and coordination, things that would make them vulnerable to sexual assault. The other things we want to do to, to show intoxication is isolate and identify over what period of time the victim was drinking, what the victim was drinking, when they were drinking, whether they were eating during the course of events. And when we're asking these questions about our victim, we could explain why. We don't have to have some sort of secret sauce, but we're asking these questions not to embarrass them or to say, hey, you were too drunk, but we're trying to show how intoxicated, trying to find evidence of how intoxicated they were and how that could have contributed to their victimization. So let the victims know and understand why we're asking these questions and trying to develop these issues. Of course, in our alcohol facilitated sexual assault cases too, we wanna to be looking for ev evidence of extreme intoxication, vomit or urinating before they could make it the bathroom, inability to walk or talk, uh, I can't tell you the number of cases I've seen where an Uber or Lyft or, or, or taxi cab driver uh, talks a victim basically being passed out in the back seat, uh, which is contrary to the offender's description. Did our offender carry the victim anywhere? Where did the assault occur and whether the victim was conscious? Other evidence of intoxication too, whether the victim had to be assisted with physical tasks like being undressed, the clothing, and sometimes the sexual acts in position. Now, one of the uh, particular aspects we wanna address about alcohol facilitated sexual assault cases, especially in the context of a, a consent defense-based case, is blackouts versus passouts. Uh, now, what pass blackouts are, blackouts involve a period of memory loss but no loss of consciousness in our victim. Essentially what happens during a blackout is that our brain's ability to form long-term memories from short-term memories is destroyed. Um, if you really wanna get into some of the physiology of it, the hippocampus of the brain uh, is, is essentially impaired during a blackout. 
Now, how this based, uh, plays into consent defense-based cases is if an offender accuses of um, uh, her offender accuses the victim or suggests the victim was in a blackout, uh, they actually gave a behavior or indications that they were consenting to the sexual activity, which our offender relied on, so then no crime. Uh, and so that's how blackouts are utilized. And it can be very difficult or hard for a victim to contest because if it's a blackout, you don't remember what happened during a blackout. Uh, this was one of the attacks used in the uh, Stanford rape case with, with Brock Turner. Now, the, how this, not to minimize the challenge from a blackout defense, but one of the ways they can be countered is by understanding how exactly blackouts happen. Now, blackouts, they aren't predicted by blood alcohol content alone. In other words, a blackout isn't necessarily triggered by a certain high BAC. What can trigger a blackout, though, is going to be if a BAC rises rapidly as opposed to slowly. Uh, a good example of, of something of an environment prime for creating blackouts is if when someone turns 21, they're trying to get 21 shots down in an hour, or they consume a lot of alcohol in a really short period of time, causing that BAC to spike rapidly. Uh, so that while they might have a lower BAC, the rapid rise is gonna be what's risking or can cause a blackout. The thing is though about a blackout is just because you're in a blackout doesn't mean you're not exhibiting signs of intoxication. So if you have a, if you're in a blackout and you're at what would be a 0.15 BAC, uh, just because you're conscious but don't have memories of being conscious doesn't mean you're necessarily acting as a sober person. You still might have the difficulty with slurred speech, with motor control, uh, with not knowing where you are, with vomiting and things like that. So even if someone is saying as a blackout, and this is why that initial interview with the offender can be so critical and these secondary witnesses, because even if our offender is later on going to allege a blackout happens, hopefully we have enough indicia of our victim's intoxication that we can argue that, hey, look, this consent that you say happened, and you're the only person conveniently that says happened, it wasn't reliable given how obviously intoxicated she was according to everyone who, who encountered or met the defendant. A pass out though, this is a distinguished in that it's essentially unconsciousness. This is essentially sedation from the CNS depressant effect and consistent with what happens when you're in surgeon, surgery. Uh, the pass out from alcohol can last for hour and for hours. And when you come to or out of a pass out, you're almost going to have a groggy or sedated feeling that can linger for 24 hours. So this is one of the reasons why if our victim remembers or believes that they were passed out and our offender is later alleging a blackout, Having talked to our victim or asking about how you felt the next day, how, how, you, how, how, how you function, can be critical to distinguishing between the likelihood of a blackout versus a pass out. Because if our victim says, I was just out of it, I felt like I had a ton of bricks on my head for the next 24 hours, uh, that's going to be consistent with the victim having passed out rather than a blackout. Um, generally speaking, and from, from a layperson's perspective, pass outs are going to occur at higher BAC levels than a blackout. Other aspect of consent-based defenses that we're going to be talking a little bit about is going to be intimate partner sexual violence. Um, and these cases are challenging, of course, because both intimate partner violence and intimate partner violent, sexual violence are underreported. And a lot of times when our victims in these cases are coming into contact with investigators and with police, uh, they, they aren't necessarily seen as interrelated. So if our victim is there to talk about marital rape, so to speak, uh, it, they might not think it's relevant to talk about the other incidents of physical violence. And similarly, if police are responding to an episode of domestic violence or intimate partner violence, it might not be thought to ask or explore in that moment, hey, have there been any moments where you, uh, uh, where, where you didn't consent to sexual activity? Uh, and of course, 
intimate partner sexual violence cases. It overplay, overlays with domestic and sexual violence dynamics. And we have to remember that in these cases, while just like our victims know their offenders better than anyone else and how they are or are not in danger, the rapists or the offenders know their victims better than anyone else. Sometimes our victims aren't even going to recognize this assault as rape as just part of the marital relationship. Now, when we're building our intimate partner sexual violence case, the, the, uh, the violence in the context of the history of the relationship is crucial. Because what this means, if there's past abuse, then those other acts means the force with non-consented to sexual assault does not have to be overt. So in other words, if our victim was in a position where they felt like if they said no, they could risk an episode of sexual violence, well, then the past episodes of sexual violence perpetrated our offender put that offender on risk. There doesn't have to be an explicit no if there's an implied threat of violence from past abuse. So really when building these cases to show that force or that implied threat of force, we wanna be conscious and aware of looking for that other criminal activity and making sure we charge any historical assaults or batteries or harassment and stalking charges, both with this victim and with former victims. Of course, like any case where there's pre-existing relationships between our offender and victims, there's gonna be a high risk of intimidation. We wanna prepare our victim for this, uh, recognize that apologies that our offender perpetrates equals confession, but can be a way of trying to tamper with the witness or manipulate the case, preserve all kind of subsequent contact from our offender, obtain cooperation of that contact, and when appropriate, follow up with appropriate bail bond motions and new charges. And folks here are actually practicing in South Dakota, but uh, just sort of charging witness intimidation gave a summary of some potential charges that could, could apply in intimidation issues. And just some quick South Dakota law on this. Uh, charge and join witness intimidation related crimes. We wanna charge it as one case. Uh, file a motion to admit other bad acts of intimidation. Don't just assume we're gonna get it in, but give our judge a heads up and include, make sure we're arguing that our witness intimidation uh, is gonna be included as evidence of consciousness of guilt and ask our courts for instruction to the jury on that point. Now with consent-based cases, and just like a lot of sexual violence cases, we wanna be proactively engaged with pretrial motions. Uh, some of our pretrial motions are gonna be engineered to protect the victim. Uh, one of those things we want to do is rape shield. And I, I know practiced uh, attorneys here are going to be saying, oh, wait a second, I, why should we file anything about rape shield? The defense has to give notice to file that. Uh, why would we want to sort of highlight the issue? And, and it is absolutely correct that if the defense Hi, everybody. I apologize. I think I lost my connection. <laughs>
uh, can, I, can someone go in the chat window? I just want to make sure that uh, folks can hear me. My apologies, I lost my connection temporarily. Can everyone, uh, where, where did I leave off? I hope it wasn't on a cliffhanger. Okay, so we caught the problem quickly enough. So I would have been embarrassed if I'd been discussing two or three different slides and uh, only now found out that I was uh, not connected to folks. Super. I apologize for, for the delay. We're going to get it fixed as quickly as we can. Uh, glad we could get our connection reestablished. Uh, but I was talking about rape shield and pretrial motions. This is fantastic. I, I, this was just a test to make sure folks were listening to me. I'm joking. So we want to file rape shield motions, even to one, prevent the defense from launching a surprise at trial of an attempt to pierce a rape shield and putting them on the record as to whether or not they're, they're planning that attempt. If there's evidence about our victim or their reputation, we got our victim's trust and things that aren't gonna be relevant to the defense that we think they may try to develop. If appropriate, we wanna file motions to prevent that or quash that from coming in. <coughs> Offender focused kind of pretrial motions that we wanna develop and utilize too is other crimes or wrong evidence. We found all this prior bad act evidence. Uh, we wanna one, file motions to make sure we get that in. And that serves a dual purpose. One, it can be a vehicle to give notice to the defense and satisfy the notice requirement of 404B. It can also uh, give our court a heads up about sensitive evidence that we wanna bring in and educate our court and their law clerk about it as well. Same reason why if we're introducing evidence of flight and consciousness of guilt, whatever we're arguing that is, we wanna be able to do that too preview our evidence as much as possible for the court using motions in limine to limit or exclude evidence, even sort of evidence with sorts of statements we want to get in, admissions we want to get in, even if it's what we think is pretty intuitive and understandable law, as much as possible, we want to give our judge a chance to understand the context about which we're trying to introduce things. Uh, protective orders, uh, these are the sorts of things, a victim-centered practice that we want to utilize to protect the identity of our victim, uh, use initials and in court filings, guard against disclosure of privileged information, um, also privacy concerns of our victims and witnesses, because we do encourage a pursuit of digital evidence and electronic evidence. We want to be careful and balanced about how, and, and I'll explain what, what's meant here too. All too often with electronic evidence and phones and digital evidence, I can see practices where a victim's phone is seized and dumped and held towards uh, the end of trial, uh, which is sometimes necessary, but often not a victim-centered practice because one, our victim is left without that device, and two, uh, there might be a lot of a victim's private life on that, on that phone uh, that's not relevant to our case and is now in our possession and arguably we could have a have a, have an obligation to disclose. So we want to talk to our victims about evidence that might exist on their devices or phones that's relevant. Get that in a way such as through screenshots in a way that is victim-centered and doesn't disrupt their life and also can hopefully protect their privacy. And then more often than not, evidence from the victim's phone can lead to probable cause to seizing the offender's devices to find corroborating evidence of whatever sort of digital evidence we need and look for other evidence on the offender's devices and phones when that's done. When we talk about pretrial motions to admit statements and things of that nature, uh, the kinds of statements we wanna be trying to get in, there's gonna be uh, maybe previous statements from our victims, such as the interview, if we want to get all of it in, we want to make sure our court's reminded about the rule of completeness at uh, 106, excited utterances we might try to get in, and statements for purposes of medical diagnosis and treatment. And the reason why we want to be admitting these types of uh, previewing these victim statements or statements in a pretrial motion is it prepares our courts and makes them more ready to anticipate and accept these types of evidence. <clears throat> 
overall for trial strategy and uh, again recognizing time limitations here we want to talk about recreating the reality of the crime and direct examination of the victim and what this means is when we're examining our victim we want to do more than just inter bringing our victim to the stand and getting to the point where we're simply checking off the elements and whatever offense that offenses we've charged but um, we want to give our jury a context of what this victim went through same thing we did with rapport building, give a chance for a victim to feel comfortable, give our jurors a chance to get to know this victim and the barriers and challenges they had in coming forward and coming through. Um, if there's a history of domestic violence and sexual assault with the offender, be sure to bring that out. Um, maintain our focus on the offender and always be framing things with a lens on what the offender did and how the offender caused trauma to the victim. We want to personalize the victim, set, take some time with our foundation. Jury must understand who the victim is in order to understand their, victim, their behavior and choices. Describe our victim's subsequent experience, especially if there's been a long time getting to trial. Talk, try to examine them about living with it, the nervousness about coming to court, how many times they've had to uh, the, participate in proceedings with authorities and coming forward in the absence of negative motivation they have. Uh, one of the questions that usually I wouldn't ask on direct but redirect is after the victim has been attacked, a question I'd often ask is your life become easier or harder since you came forward? And most victims will talk about how their life became harder but that's a great way in closing to set up the basis for this negative motivation that our victims have to come forward uh, then their only real motivation is just to tell the truth and to get justice. So a lot of times there's going to be victim behavior that's going to be challenged or uh, the challenging to help our jurors to understand or victim behavior that's going to be attacked by the defense. Uh, one of the ways we want to do uh, respond to that is recognize that some types of victim behavior is going to be beyond the ken of typical jurors. It's always an issue. It's going to be on the understanding of typical jurors. And so one of the ways that we want to consider explaining that is with the use of victim behavior experts. Now, the practical analysis of how this proceeds is that we want to identify the behaviors in our case that need explaining, consider all the potential strategies to educate our, our fact finder about those behaviors and the commonality among, uh, with the in the commonality of those behaviors uh, by victims of sexual assault. And then perhaps consider victim behavior experts, people that are qualified, folks that are within our budget and appropriate. Now, identifying the issues in, involved in the case and consent-based the cases, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but these are often the kinds of issues that can be involved. And I'm not, some of these we've addressed, some of them we haven't. Uh, but there's a list of them and you have copies of the PowerPoint, so I'm not going to break down each one. Now, experts that can explain this, it can be a variety of people and ultimately how we're thinking of these experts is they aren't there to talk about this particular victim or to vouch for this victim or to give an opinion that this victim was raped or act consistently with a, as a rape victim. But what these experts are there to do, sort of similar in function to maybe an expert at a drug trafficking trial who talks about how controlled substances are consistent uh, with an intent to deliver it. A possible expert is someone who has experience working with victims of sexual violence and can talk about the range of behaviors and that there is no common response or typical reaction by a victim, but that every response or reaction is individualized to that victim. So again, for most of our jurors, the first time they're really confronted with an incident of sexual violence is gonna be in this case. Other than that, they really just believe the sort of stereotypes about victim responses that they might see on TV or in media or in the culture generally, without any experience working directly with victims. Our experts can say, well, I can't tell you how this victim did or didn't react, uh, but I know sometimes there's delayed reporting. In my experience with the hundreds or thousands of victims I worked with, uh, when there's an intimate partner relationship or a marital relationship, a lot of times that's a dynamic that contribute to delayed reporting. 
oh yeah, I've seen a lot of victims that have engaged in risk-taking behavior, continued uh, contact with an offender after a sexual assault. Some of the dynamics can affect that is for some victims uh, that they're just trying to get a sense of control or trying to, c blaming themselves for what happened or not wanting to harm an offender's reputation uh, because there was a level of trust between that victim and the offender. So we want our experts there to talk about behaviors by victims generally, rather than behaviors from a specific victim. Now the type of folks who can be victims are folks who have experience working with, the, with them. And these are the different categories of victim advocate, maybe forensic psychiatrist or psychologist or SANE, director of a shelter. Um, oops, sorry, that came up on the shared screen. Let me move that over here. Um, and uh, in a scholar or researcher. Now, logistical process for when we use a victim behavior experts is we secure them for trial testimony. Uh, we provide a discovery, which on level is going to be one level is going to be the curriculum vitae of our expert, and also an expert report. Now, the substance of these expert reports, ideally, the expert we're using knows nothing about the case. They're just there to talk about whatever behaviors we've identified and just give a general uh, report addressing that. And we also want to file motions beforehand to litigate, litigate the admissibility of expert testimony pre-trial. Um, if folks like in contact Equitas, we can give you some sample motions along those lines and we'd be happy to work with you in that. Now the basis for expertise, of course, is going to be uh, Rule 702 under South Dakota law. And understand a lot of times the, uh, the qualifications of these expert witnesses is going to be, can be their experience. It doesn't have to be a specific certificate or anything of that nature. Um, and what they're there to educate jurors about is something based on their specialized knowledge, responses of sexual violence victims to understand the evidence. Now, the necessity of this is because the reality is people talk about a CSI effect, and we're referencing a study here. CSI effect doesn't actually exist when they did a study in any kind of case except for rape case, cases where jurors were expecting something more, and our victim behavior experts can certainly help satisfy that something more that jurors need. Um, looking at the time, I'm going to sort of page through these. The other thing I want to suggest about victim behavior experts is to utilize a blind expert. Uh, haven't met with the victim. They're not diagnosing the victim as a victim of rape, and they know very little of the facts of the case because they're not there to vouch for the credibility of our victim. Some danger areas we want them to stay away from are things relating to a diagnosis of our victim, uh, and these are different areas relating to that and avoiding the danger zones, which is commenting on the credibility of the victim, finding that the victim was raped or diagnosing our victim. Now, if we're not using a victim behavior expert or can't be utilized, sometimes our victim can articulate their experience and their reason for whatever responses they did that are challenging. Sometimes a, our investigator or a SANE can talk about behaviors or challenges that weren't, didn't seem unusual or something shocking. Uh, in the context of their experience, which can help educate a jury too. Uh, so closing argument, of course, uh, we wanna focus on summarizing the evidence, the, focusing on the offender's conduct, uh, connect the jury with the victim's experience and use expert testimony to support our victim witness and testimony. So going forward, before I investigate what happened to our internet connection, we wanna recognize the dangerousness of known offenders identify and collect evidence of our offender's predatory behavior, support victim and witness credibility with cooperating evidence, and recreate the reality of the crime at trial. So everyone, I see we're about two minutes from one. I uh, apologize for the technical interruption. I'm sure we're gonna have that fixed by one o'clock and I hope folks can rejoin us for our strangulation presentation at uh, um, well, one o'clock my time. I guess it's 12 o'clock your time if I'm correct. Um, so folks, take care, and I look forward to seeing you this afternoon. Uh, I could initially ask, are there any sort of open questions that uh, folks have that I can address? You can type them into the chat window. I'll see if I can address them. Okay. If not, I'll uh, see you at one o'clock. See you in an hour.